what I'm talking about today, parallel repetition, is about these things called multiplayer games, which are interactions between a referee and uh, some players. So the referee will sample uh, questions, which here I've labeled as x1 through xk, from some uh, query distribution. And it'll send the ith question to the ith player. Uh, the players are just functions. They have to come up with some respective answers and send them back to their referee. And uh, then the referee says that the players all win or they all lose. Um, and so these multiplayer games are important in various parts of computer science, which I won't get into that much or at all, actually. Um, the main question about a multiplayer game is what is the probability with which the players can win if they use the optimal strategy? Um, and so this is called the value of the game and it's what, what you study, I guess. Um, and there's this transformation that you can do to a game if you're trying to amplify its hardness or something. Just a second, uh, uh, which, uh, just in a question about the previous slide. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Just uh, so the referee is just a function uh, from you know what he sees to ex win or lose. Yes, the and it's a it's a distribution a game, of queries. Yeah. And so when you say game, you really refer to this function, and uh, that right. the referee computes, and the value of the game is the probability that they all win. Yeah. The value of the game is a probability that they all win if they use the optimal strategy. Um, and there is a variance of the value that you can define if the players are allowed to be entangled or other generalizations. But I'll, I'll just be focusing on what's called the classical value, where um, each player is just a function. Okay, so. Let me say what parallel repetition is, just for those of you who don't know. Um, so you start with a, a game, and you when, you when I say you repeat the game n times in parallel, what that means is that you now have a different referee, which instead of sampling one of these question tuples, it samples n of them independently. And it just gives the, each player um, the corresponding question from each one of these tuples. And, and Basically, the players play in each one of, of these uh, instances simultaneously, so they come up with answers uh, for each, each copy. And the players are said to win in the parallel repetition if they win in every single copy of the game. Okay, so the question about parallel repetition is, of course, how does it affect the value of the game? Um, and I guess the yes. first thing that you can should- say something? Yeah, yeah, of course. Oh yeah, I forgot to say at the beginning. Please, everybody just interrupt whenever you have any questions. Yeah, this is the nature of this seminar. <laughs> uh -huh. I, I, yeah, of course. Yeah. So, so uh, obviously the goal is to, uh, if some game has some winning probability, something you want to lower it. You want to lower the probability that the, the, uh, these PIs are uh, uh, successful. And uh, maybe an obvious comment is that if you just repeated the game again and again sequentially, if each time they could succeed with probability alpha, uh, after k times they can only, only succeed in all of them, in alpha to mm -hmm. the k. So there's obvious exponential decay in the case that this is done sequentially. And the mm -hmm. model you, talk about here, the parallel repetitions, what happens if we tell them all the questions uh, in advance? And yeah, yeah, and how it decays them. Yeah, that's a good point. And a good uh, thing to keep in mind. Um, so, yeah, I guess the first thing about parallel repetition is that unlike sequential repetition, it is not that trivial. You might hope that you have a direct product theorem, where if you repeat the game n times, then the value just goes down exponentially, exactly like you'd expect, taking it to the nth power. Um, that's actually not the case. Uh, there are a couple of famous counterexamples. Um, 
showing that the value of the repeated game can actually be bigger than what you'd expect. Um, we do know uh, a very general bound, DT Verbitsky, which says that if you repeat enough times, then eventually the value of the repeated game will go to zero. Um, but this bound is incredibly slow. Like it's just this uh, inverse Ackerman function. So like basically there's no English sentences that can describe how slow it is other than to just say it's inverse Ackerman. Um, in the special case of two player games though, there is this uh, great result by Ron Ross, which is later simplified by and approved by others, which um, says that you do get an exponential decay, even though the, the uh, base of this exponent might not be uh, exactly what you'd expect from a direct product theorem. So two player games we understand fairly well. Um, uh, but of course we want to understand all games. So in particular, we want to know what happens if you have uh, more than two players. Um, so there has been some work on this. Um, for a limited class of games, we do know that we get the exponential decay that we would expect, um, or in, in the sense, expect in the sense of like a run ross type result. Um, so in, namely these, the techniques for analyzing two player games generalize to a limited class of three player games. Um, it turns out that this condition on three player games that basically covers when previous techniques apply is that the query set, so that the, the set of all possible queries that a referee might ask is connected. And connected, I mean that in the sense, a little bit of a strange sense, but if you start with, if you take any two possible queries the referee might ask, you can get from the one to there by just changing uh, one player's query at a time. And the whole time you're doing this, you, uh, um, you, you keep a valid query, like a query that might, the referee might actually have asked. It's a, a little bit strange, but if you have a query distribution with this property, then we can prove exponential bounds. Um, and for games besides games like this, that's really this inverse Ackerman bound. It's the best that was known. Now, uh, so some of these, one of these papers, a paper by Diener et al, that uh, sort of unified what was known about uh, three player games, put forward this uh, particular game called the GHC game from a quantum information theory, which they said seems to be the hardest instance of, uh, of proving a more general parallel repetition. And um, I guess one, interpretation of this work is that, I mean, maybe it's not really the hardest instance. It's maybe the easiest instance because that's what we're able to prove something for. Uh, but let me just tell you what the GHZ game is before going on. Okay. So uh, to specify the game, we need to say uh, what the query distribution is and then what the answers need to satisfy. So the query distribution is the set of all, or it's a uniform distribution on the set of all uh, like three bit strings with parity zero. So each player gets a bit. And uh, just thinking back to this notion of connectivity that I mentioned earlier, you can kind of see that this distribution is very, very far from satisfying that property. Because if you change just a single player's input at all, that will no longer be a valid query. So I think that's maybe why uh, it was suspected to be one of the hardest uh, cases. Um, so the other part of the game is saying that the answers have to satisfy some predicate. We actually don't need to care about what the, the winning uh, predicate is, but I guess if you're, if you're curious, it's that the XOR of the answers is equal to the AND of the, the inputs. Uh, but we don't need to, to, to know this for the rest of the talk. We just need to know that the value of the game is, uh, well, we don't even need to know about the actual exact value of the game. We just need to know that the value of the game is less than one. So our bounds, our proof techniques don't depend on the precise winning condition or the actual like precise value of the game. Um, oh, so before I, I go on, I, I should say like, there is a reason that people uh, care about the GHC game in quantum information theory. 
And it's that even the, it's one of the reasons is that quantum players, so players that share an entangled state, are able to uh, win this game with probability one. And so, so one thing that this game gives you is immediately a test for quantumness. Um, but moreover, this game has other nice properties that I, I guess quantum information theorists care about, which is that the, the strategy that wins with probability one is essentially unique. So it's a way of, it gives a way of testing that uh, some players actually have an entangled state of, or like an, yeah, a particular entangled state, which then you can use for other, other things. Uh, anyway, so the, what we prove is that if you repeat this GHC game a uh, large number of times, then the value of the repeated game goes down inverse polynomially. So uh, that's of course a, a big improvement over over like this inverse Ackerman. Um, but there's still like just, just one small exponential improvement that you might hope to get from, uh, and, and we don't know if that's possible. So uh, just, just to clarify, uh, despite the motivation you gave about the quantum uh, uh, case and uh, what happens if they do share an entanglement for this talk, you're talking about uh, players that are isolated. Yeah, for this talk, I'm just talking about classical, uh, classical provers. That yeah, so isolated, they, they don't they have any entanglement. in advance, whatever they want, but when, when they get the input, each one acts on its own input and cannot right. yeah. learn anything from They them. can coordinate ahead of time and they can use shared randomness or individual randomness if they want. That, that using randomness doesn't, doesn't help them. Yeah, so they are just functions, as you said in the beginning. Yeah. Okay. And, and the result um, with, for more than three players, it doesn't hold? The result for more than three than players? Three player? um, yeah, so the GHC game is just defined for a few players. We didn't, we're not really claiming anything very general about other, other games. For now, we're just focusing on this game because it's a, a game that seemed to be the hardest and because um, it's, it's just an, a game of, of interest. It just seems like you could uh, just generalize it in a natural way. Yeah, you, you, could, you could easily generalize, make like a, an, like a K player version of the GHC game, right? Like, um, yeah, I think, I, mean, I think, but I'm not, not sure that our techniques might go through to analyze such a game, but not, not sure. Um, so before I, I tell you about our techniques, I need to give a little bit of background about parallel repetition and like what it is that we need to prove to prove a parallel repetition bound. So we, at the, at a, at the highest level, we follow like an approach that has been used in all the prior works and we also I mean, use it in this work and we'll probably use it in future works. So say you have a strategy for the, for the game, so specifying what all the players are going to do. And you just consider um, like running the game. So you have the referee sample, the, the, uh, running the repeated game. So the referee samples a bunch of questions and the players produce their answers, which are why. Um, and what we'll do to analyze this is we'll think about uh, what are a set, like what is a set of uh, hard coordinates to uh, like what are a set of coordinates in which the players cannot win with uh, very good probability and we'll build up this set inductively so we'll start with, with nothing so the players win in the nothing set probability one vacuously and we'll we'll iterate by saying that as long as this set is a set of coordinates in which the players are winning with a relatively high probability above some threshold then there exists some other coordinate such that um, conditioned on winning in all the instances, all the coordinates that you're, you've considered so far, the probability of winning in this new coordinate is still uh, bounded away from one. So it's less than 0.99. Um, and if you can do that, if you can do that, then you add this coordinate to your set and continue. And if you can keep doing this, then the the probability of winning in all the coordinates that you've considered so far 
just goes down exponentially as you keep adding coordinates to your set. Um, and at the end, then you'll have that your probability of winning all of these coordinates, and in particular, your probability of winning everything is at most um, your threshold or 0.99 to the end. But if it's 0.99 to the end, then you have an exponential bound and you're happy. So we'll be limited by this threshold. Uh, so does this high level approach make sense? I hope. So um, I just uh, want to make sure the coordinates are just in the range one to n. One of the games they are playing in parallel. Yeah. And you're trying to yeah. collect as many as you can for which the players cannot win with probability one. In fact, their probability of success is bound, bounded uh, below one, given that they have won the other games in S so far. Yes. Yeah, so I will, yeah, one thing I want to mention is that I'm, I'm using the term coordinate to refer to one of the repetitions. And I, I might accidentally be inconsistent in what I call them. I might call them repetitions or instances, uh, but I'll try to stick with coordinates. Yeah, so in some sense, you are trying to uh, emulate the um, proof that in the sequential case, if they were acting, uh, you know, the games were playing one after the other, uh, yeah. that uh, you get a reduction each time. And uh, somehow you are able to do it in the parallel case, uh, find such a coordinate yeah. that gets another constant factor less than one, as much as yeah. long as you can. So the hard part in this strategy is um, finding a hard coordinate in the conditional distribution, because conditioning on, on on the event of winning in some set of coordinates is could be quite a complicated event. We, the, our strategy that determines whether or not we win could be arbitrary, and we still need to try to analyze and find a hard coordinate. Um, so we'll abstract a little bit. Like I said, this uh, event of winning in a set of coordinates is relatively complicated. And so there's a sort of standard way that you can simplify or abstract out a little bit and only consider uh, product events. And what I mean by product events is that the event is uh, something about the first player's query and something about the second player's query and something about the third player's query. Uh, so for example, uh, once we've fixed a strategy that we're considering, we could have the i. So we could have e i be that the uh, that in some particular coordinate, the i th player's input is some particular value, and their output is some particular value, because the output just depends on their input. Uh, once we fix the strategy, and actually, like this kind of event is the reason that we can. It suffices to just consider product events because. This, uh, the event of winning in S coordinates is the union of a relatively small number of events like this. Question? And, yeah. And uh, the sufficiently big refers to the fact that you still didn't go down <laughs> in the upper bound so far. Um, you know, S did not provide you enough decay yet. Um, yeah, yeah. So when we in the the strategy in the the box, we still need to. We're only considering when the when we haven't gone down too far. There's like a row there, and when we think about just product events, there'll be some row prime that we only need to analyze events that happen with sufficiently big probability that's related to the probability there. Is that what you were asking? Or, I mean. Yeah, you answered it. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's just as long as you didn't go down enough, if you didn't prove your theorem, uh, this is a big event, and you can condition on it and find another con coordinate. Right. Um, okay. So uh, next, so this is what, what the hard thing that we need to do in in or the hard thing that up is showing that there is a uh, 
a coordinate, which is hard, conditioned on, on your event E. And the way that previous works did this is by constructing something that's called a local embedding. And to explain what a local embedding is, suppose that you wanted to show a hardness of some coordinate. The way to do that is to first, you know, suppose otherwise for the sake of contradiction, like next do some stuff and then uh, finally get a contradiction, right? This is how, how, of course, you would do a proof by contradiction. Uh, but to be more specific, uh, so first to suppose otherwise, you say that you have a strategy that works well on the conditional query distribution. So here I've just depicted what this strategy might look like. And in general, whenever I put tildes on top of something, that, that should indicate that I'm thinking about this conditional query distribution instead of the unconditioned query distribution. Um, and now when you want to get a contradiction, we want to reduce to some statement about the original unrepeated game. So we want, uh, some, we want to construct some strategy that just takes as input a single uh, copy of queries and produces as output the corresponding answers. And this, um, this strategy that we're constructing still needs to be a valid strategy. It needs to be local. So what we need to connect the dots here is what's called a local embedding. So this is um, some, like, it's basically like, uh, it's three different functions. These functions are allowed to use shared randomness or local randomness or whatever. But um, this, this local embedding takes as input a single query and outputs uh, something that is close to the conditional query distribution. Um, and it needs to incorporate its input somehow. So what, what it does is it, it, it needs to also take its input and embed it in the, the jth coordinate of the conditional query distribution. So this is a coordinate that you're trying to show is hard. So, I mean, this is basically like, if you didn't get that, it's just what you would come up with if you were trying to uh, do a black box reduction to prove hardness of some coordinate. Uh, it's just, it's like a, yeah, it's just like a pretty straightforward definition actually. Um, anyways, so I wanna, so that, that's like the sort of- yeah, Just say yeah. one. One thing, so uh, just uh, reinterpreting your uh, statement about this slide. I mean, uh, you're saying that if what you want to prove doesn't happen, then somewhere in this complex event, uh, there is a hidden uh, strategy for the single instance game, which does better than the value of the game, which is impossible. And how to, yeah. how to, how to find it or how to find this complex, uh, and dimensional event strategies for an individual game is this what the local embedding is supposed to give us. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. So the local embedding is just a a way of taking your complex strategy and distilling out a, a single instance uh, strategy. So. Um, we will sort of use local embeddings in this work. So we want to analyze the hardness of the GHV distribution when you condition an arbitrary event E. And we'll, we'll sort of do three things. So first we'll show that we will actually get the hardness that we want when E is a linear event. And for this, we'll use the whole framework of local embeddings. Um, then we'll prove that a certain notion of a pseudo linear events are as hard as linear events. And this step is, is not via a local embedding. And it's actually like one of the more confusing parts of the work is getting the, well, getting the right notion of pseudo linearity is hard. Um, and finally, we'll take an arbitrary event and we'll decompose it into to parts, which are um, all pseudo linear. And so if we can get this decomposition of the event into different parts for which we have hardness on each of the parts, then we can deduce that the, the whole uh, event is hard, like, like the whole conditional distribution condition on that event is hard. Um, 
Yeah, so that's, that's just like the high level outline of where we're going. So the first step is analyzing linear events. And so uh, specifically linear events, I just mean like some linear subspace over F2. And so what we, we claim is that if the event is uh, big enough, so having small co-dimension, um, then there's many coordinates of the conditional distribution into which you can construct a local embedding. So in other words, there's many hard coordinates. Um, and I, I'll try to give a little bit of intuition for this uh, part of the result, um, but for a simpler version where we'll really let the events be very big and it'll just show that there's one coordinate where you can do a local embedding. So the way that we'll do this is we'll consider a set of like some linear equations which define your event E. So it's, we all know that a, a linear subspace with co-dimension M can be defined by M linear equations. So we'll think about what these equations actually are. I mean, this isn't unique, but just take some set of linear equations and think about the coefficients for each of the different coordinates. So the, the, the some, this event is constraining the inputs in different coordinates. And, um, and so for each coordinate, there is like a, a set of some like small list of coefficients that are, are used in, in these equations. Just the small because there's not that many equations. And by the pigeonhole principle, there have to be some two coordinates that have identical coefficients. So the, your equations treat these, co these different coordinates exactly the same. Um, and without loss of generality, we can say that, like say these are the first two coordinates. Um, now, what the, so what this means for the equations to use x1 and x2 symmetrically is that it, it doesn't really constrain x1 and x2 except via their xor. Because if you have an equation that's like some stuff plus x1 equals some other stuff, it actually, because it also needs to use x2 in the same way, has to say the stuff plus x1 plus x2 equals some other stuff. So, um, so the point is that like x, if you just look at x1 individually, that's not really constrained. And so the idea of the local embedding is then that um, if you want to embed a query into the, the first coordinate, you can have the players just sample, um, you can, they can sample all this stuff using shared randomness. So they can sample the XOR of X1 and X2. And then they can sample all the rest of the stuff we don't really care about. Um, and and uh, the distribution of this doesn't actually depend on the distribution of X1 in a sense. So what the embedding can do is take, take this, um, this query, set that to be X1, and then define X2 by just XORing in this, um, this X1, X or X2 that, they, that all the players know. And um, so the point is that step two, you can, each player can do locally. Like the players, the, 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 sorry, the embedding doesn't like, the, the way that the embedding knows the uh, little x that it was given is sort of distributed. Like the first part knows the first part of x, the second part of the second part of x and so on. Um, but the, yeah, the, I don't know, this, this, this whole computation in step two can be done locally. Uh, yeah, are there uh, questions about this? I'll, like, I'll let this stay up a little bit uh, in case people have questions or comments. Okay. <laughs> So is the log is the log n limitation while you're getting the one in polynomial? No, so we are actually there's actually okay. a different like so this is just a simplified version. You're right that if I just use this technique, I mean this this simple version would be, be stuck at, at uh, polynomial. There's um, like 
but there, there's a way to like improve this particular part of the proof so that it, it could in principle get, get you down to an exponential bound. So what's the second part then, the, the, the fact that you can take an arbitrary one and convert it to a small number of these? No, surprisingly, it's the <laughs> part where we, we approximate, have like approximate linear events. And like, so, well, I mean, we have to define what's the right notion of like approximately linear, but like okay. finding some notion where you can both do a decomposition into approximately linear and have approximately linear, like reflect yeah. the hardness of linear events. Um, that like, yeah, it seems like, I don't know. It seems tricky. Uh, yeah. So that's like sort of, so anyways, I, I've said step one of the, the kind of the proof overview. Um, and so the next two parts rely on, on relaxing a little bit to what we'll call like pseudo linear sets instead of just linear events. Um, and so on the one hand, we want to, like I, like I was just saying, we want to prove that um, with the right notion of pseudo-linear sets, they're as hard as linear events, so we can inherit the hardness that we just proved. On the other hand, you want to be able to decompose arbitrary events as unions of uh, pseudo-linear events. Um, and we need, so we need some notion of pseudo-linearity, and I'll just say, roughly what the notion of linear of pseudo linearity that we end up using is. And I mean, it's possible that you could maybe use another notion and get a different result. I don't know. Uh, but here's the, reason, the, the notion that we use. It's um, closely related to the notion of a small bias set, which is a standard notion in uh, pseudo randomness. So a, say that a set is small bias in a sort of containing uh, linear space. If you can't distinguish a, a uniformly random sample from the um, small bias set versus a, a, a have, what we, we end up using is a closely related notion of a, uh, uh, where we just, we just, on the one hand, we allow the distinguishers to have a somewhat longer output, which makes achieving this notion of pseudo uh, linearity a bit harder. On the other hand, we don't need to, we don't like require that something about all linear distinguishers, just uh, product distinguishers, where, where the product distinguishers, you can think of these as uh, the product is representing the fact that there's three players who are uh, separated. Can um, I just one comment? Uh, uh, I'm just uh, able to since uh, uh, I seem to ask most of the questions. If anybody has a question about the linearity, uh, the linear case, um, uh, it uh, will get only complicated. So any clarification you want from Justin about the linear case, uh, you just ask. Yeah. And if not, uh, it's it's also kind of okay. <laughs> but like, I mean, I would like you to understand. But but we do kind of use the linear case as a black box. We don't like do a more complicated version of the analysis that we just did. Well, like sort how of. You, I'm sorry, how, I was just gonna ask, how do you get get to n instead of log n? Oh, okay, good question. So, um, so here we use this sort of pigeonhole principle where we said that there are two coordinates that are used in exactly the same way. But um, so, in for the to go beyond that, like we instead look for two subsets of the coordinates whose um, well, if you look at their like coefficient vectors, they, they sort of subset sum to the same thing. So that's, uh, or, or sort of subset sum to zero, I guess. So that's like a, the generalization from, from the, the two things being exactly the same. 
Um, and I, I guess I, I won't like explain in detail how that works, but that's like the, the crux of the idea. But uh, uh, just continuing yeah. um, your explanation there, uh, can you go back to the slide? Sure. Yeah, so uh, the first case with the pigeonhole, uh, you know, that this IJ, that these two coordinates are the same, maybe we can, you should think of the characteristic vectors of these two and um, the sum of, uh, you know, the sum of coefficients, which is one in one, is also one in the other. Mm -hmm. exclusive, this exclusive all. And this is generalized in uh, this, um, what you say, the exclusive all of, you know, the two, two more complex vectors. Wait, sorry, I, 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 like, I think I missed, could you, could you say that? I, I yeah, I'm just exactly trying to generalize said. from the pigeonhole case to the more general case, which you just explained. And in the first case, they are identical, so the sum is zero, and you mm -hmm. allow other you know, pairs uh, where the sum, the coordinate wise sum is uh, zero. Yeah, 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 exactly. Thanks. Okay, so um, I hope that gives like some intuition for how you analyze the linear case at least. Um, so going back to trying to analyze this sort of pseudo linear case. So we have this notion and for most of the, the talk, I think you should just think of the notion as being small bias sets. Um, but like technically we have these other modifications that we need to do. I'm not sure um, I didn't so, know what this means, so. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, sorry, yeah, yeah, I think I, I was in the middle, I, I think I just explained it when you came back, but. Oh, sorry, um, yeah, thanks. So, um, but Avid, you know, you know what a small bias set is, right? I sure do. Okay. Uh, so the, the one, of, so one of the questions we need to, and so to make this approach work is um, if conditioning on a small bias set gives you a query distribution that's as hard as conditioning on just the linear event that the small bias set is supposed to be approximating. And um, so this is like, this is not clear at all because um, so we care about the, whether these uh, distributions are similar, or these sets are similar in the sense of um, hardness of conditional distributions, but small bias and other types of pseudorandomness are usually about the hardness of distinguishing if you're given a sample from um, one or the other. Um, so like really it's kind of like, I don't know, as far as I know, it's kind of just a coincidence that <laughs> We lost your voice, I think. Yeah, I wasn't uh, sure that, it was me. The, yeah, cut off. Oh, okay. Um, where should, ha, ha, for how long? Oh, no, it's saying my internet connection is unstable. Um, I hope it, so it gets- So it was just the second bullet point that we didn't hear. Oh, okay. So I, I was saying that I, in contrast to the type of indistinguishability that we're hoping for here, um, the notion of small bias and also just in general, the uh, usual notions of pseudorandomness are about the hardness of distinguishing uh, given a single sample from, from your, or just given a sample from um, one distribution or the other. Um, and so the, 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 I, this, the property of preserving hardness seems to be something a little bit more structural about the distribution. So, to actually show that small bias sets are as hard as linear events, we need to use a new trick. Um, and it's, it's kind of specific to the um, linear events that, uh, that, we'll, are, that we'll actually need to consider in our proof. And so these linear events, um, they're like what I, I kind of think of them as like being generalized GHD distributions. So they're these, these sets are the set of like all two like triplets from a vector space where the sum of those 
the sum of each one of those vectors is equal to zero. Um, so this is a, the, um, we'll eventually reduce our um, problem to like showing that if you have a small bias set in one of these types of linear uh, spaces, then the conditioning on that small bias set preserves, has like some hardness. Um, and just like for brevity in this and on future slides, the, the way that we can uh, write this kind of uh, linear space is just as a tensor product of your original uh, GHZ space with this um, new linear space. I won't use any fancy tensor anything. I'll just use that just so I don't have to keep on writing this wordy description. Um, so let's see, what is this trick? Well, oh, before I get to that, like this, this weird part of our proof turns out to be kind of the reason that we, we only get a polynomial, inverse polynomial bound. Um, and I think understanding what's happening here is, or understanding a little bit better is, would kind of pay dividends. I don't think we understand this part very well right now. So the trick that I'm uh, going to use for this, uh, this case goes back to how I said that product events are like, kind of the only thing that we need to care about in parallel repetition. Um, so, um, so say we're sampling our queries from this, uh, this space. Uh, so if you want to look at a product event, specifically looking at the probability that this product event happens, you can write a formula that's not too hard to prove with Fourier analysis. It's pretty standard, I guess, um, which writes this probability as the sum of a, a bunch of products of, co of Fourier coefficients. So, no, no, animation. So what I wanted to say is that, so these Fourier coefficients, each Fourier coefficient is the, um, the correlation of, of this event with a linear function. So it's, it's a, specifically the correlation of the indicator function for this event with the linear function. Um, and I, yeah, so just looking at the second bullet point now, um, one of these Fourier coefficients is special. Like the zeroth Fourier coefficient is just the probability that that individual event happens. So, that, so um, the zeroth coefficient of zeroth Fourier coefficient of EI is the probability that if you just look at XI by itself, that that XI is an EI. And so one thing you can take away from this Fourier formula, which is what we'll use basically, is that if all the other Fourier coefficients are close to zero, then um, the product event behaves as if, the, as, as if they're all independent. So it's as if your, um, your queries x1, x2, x3 are independent, even though in, in reality they have this, this linear correlation. So it's like the only way to exploit this linear correlation is by, by having events that are somewhat linear. Okay, and this is sort of tantalizing because if it really were the case that the queries were independent, this falls in the class of, of three-player games for which we do know how to do exponential decay bounds. Um, so, and I, I was kind of saying that product events are the only things that we care about and, um, and in this case where the, the product events are uncorrelated with linear functions, they act like, like this, this one type of parallel repetition that we know how to do. And, I, and like the polar opposite of that is if the events are all linear and in that case I know how to handle. Um, but this is not a proof. This is just like some observations that might make one hopeful. Um, and I'm not claiming, claiming a formal collection here. Okay, so how do we actually leverage small biasness? 
Um, so suppose that we have a small bias set. This is a funky shape that I, I drew here. And um, it's small bias in this type of uh, linear space. Um, and we, see if we fix a particular strategy that works on the, on the small bio set. And we want to use that to construct a strategy for the, the whole linear space. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll first construct some kind of decomposition of the space and the event. So, so this should say cosets, not coset. So we'll, the decomposition will be lots of cosets of a linear space. And we'll want it to have uh, some properties. So first of all, if you restrict to a random coset, then the outputs of your strategy are almost independent. Um, and the way that we'll do this is going through this observation about when events look independent. And so this, this kind of generalizes the functions too. If you have, as long as, as some coordinate of F tilde is not linear, like not even correlated with the linear function, then the outputs will look independent. So we'll do a kind of iterative refinement of to construct our decomposition. Like we'll say if we're if we're in the bad case where your strategy is correlated with the linear function, then like say that linear function is G, then we'll split our event into two parts. One is the part where G is zero, and the other is the part where G is one. And in a sense, we've made progress because. Um, there's no more correlation if you just look at a specific part. And the actual argument uses a, some kind of more complicated potential function. But, but once we do that, then once we decompose like this, then we can uh, kind of make it, our strategy look like it's just producing independent outputs on each component. Um, I will note that I, I'm kind, I was kind of lying a little bit when I, when I just said that we can use the previous slide because in the previous slide, I was talking about independence on of events under like the linear distribution, not the, the small bias side. But um, we can use the fact that the, the set is just big to, um, to make up for that. So moving from the linear event to the small bias set, we pay uh, inverse proportionally to the probability of the event. And that is actually the reason that we get that, I mean, if we didn't have to do that, then we would probably get an exponential bound. Okay, so the, the next thing that we want about this decomposition is that, I mean, we want it to actually be like abstracting our worldview. We, I don't wanna think about what happens inside of a component. I just wanna think about which component we're in and what the output of the strategy is on that component. Um, but I mean, I do need to care about, I mean, I care about winning in the jth coordinate. So I do need to care about what the player's inputs are in the jth coordinate. So in order to do that, I'll just make, I'll, I just want the component that we're in to determine what the inputs are in the jth coordinate. Um, so we can do that. Like I, we just first, first do a decomposition based on what the player's inputs are and then do the refinement procedure that I described where you just get rid of all the linear correlations. Okay, Question. so that, that's how we, yeah? Yeah, so this refinement procedure, uh, why does it uh, stop or stops where we were? It's one over polynomial? Uh, uh, oh, how, like how, so you ask, yeah, it's, it's inverse, the, the number of steps is, inversely proportional to the, um, like the delta and like your delta dependence. So um, yeah, there, there's some like entropy based potential argument. And I think I won't, I wasn't planning to go into that specifically, but I'll, I'll see a similar decomposition shortly. That like is sort of how you, how we do these decompositions. Okay. Um, Okay, so once we've gotten this decomposition, this, we'll use this to define a randomized strategy on the linear space. And remember, using randomness is fine. That doesn't 
change things for, for these multiplayer games. So in each component, we have, um, we have on the left side, some like independent uh, distributions for each, what each player should do. So on the right side, we'll just label each component by the distributions that each player is supposed to output. And then the strategy on the right hand side will be just kind of look at what component you're in and, um, and then have each player sample from the right distribution. And well, so, no, it's simple from the right distribution, namely filling the other coordinates uh, as if they were coming from that distribution. So, wait, I, I'm sorry. Uh, so the, the each player uh, will look only at the JS input it got. We'll complete all the other coordinates uh, according to this distribution and behave and then its function tells it what to do. Yeah, so, so I guess maybe not just the straight inputs, but it'll look at um, it'll look at which of these parts it's in, which includes the jth input and a little bit more, but not everything. And based on that, it determines what the right probabilities are. Yeah, I just wanted to and then it flips the coins. is for the player to somehow fill uh, in. I mean, you want a strategy for the one player game and what you are given is a strategy for the end player game on some subset. So uh, um, the high level uh, yeah. thing as I understand at least in previous schools is uh, yeah, you get to, you're in a single game, you get to the one input and maybe you have this extra information about the partition and so on. Uh, and then you want to sample the other coordinates uh, and sort of imagine you are in the end player uh, situation and uh, you just, there you have a strategy so you know what to do about it. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess so. I mean, the, the, I think I think the point here is that you don't need to like, yeah, yeah sure. I, I guess you can just just sample um, sample from the yeah, each player on the right. The, sorry, the player on the right hand side can just sample um, from like from the part on the left hand side that is supposed to, like sort of resample. I don't know. Yeah, I was making a very high level point, not a fine point. I just said that we are trying to reduce uh, from unlikely success in the um, uh, parallelly repeated game and times uh, uh, in some event, we are trying to find a strategy for a single player game. So high level, high level point is that uh, somehow uh, to describe the single player strategy, uh, single player strategy, they each get one input and they magically with all your machinery uh, are able to imagine that in an end player game and in this event, and they know each how to sample uh, the other coordinates and if they got um, uh, end player value uh, inputs, and uh, for this, you use a strategy given to you, which uh, uh, is too successful. So, um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so um, can you explain how it's different from the local embedding? Because what I've described was just local embedding, but you said that you're doing something uh, different. Um, right. So. I guess I don't know for, for sure that you cannot do a local embedding, but what our analysis is doing is something that's specific to the, the strategy, sort of. So like, um, whereas a local embedding is just, it says that like once you have a conditional distribution, you just like construct, so you, you, like the embedding just depends on the distribution. But here we are doing like some analysis at least that depends on the strategy that you're using on the conditional distribution. So, I mean, 
so it, it might be possible to reframe this as as constructing a local embedding, but I, I at least it doesn't look like it. Like, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Yeah, so, so just certainly the, the way that we, we analyze it is is like not explicitly com coming up with a local embedding. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess I don't really have a a good sense of whether that's inherent. Um, okay. So, sorry. Um, so, anyways, so in order to 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 um, say that this like new strategy that we've defined on the on the linear event has the same success probability as as this strategy we were given on the on the conditional distribution, um, we like the, sort of the last thing that we we need is that uh, so we, we already so far we, we we've like defined things so that within each component um, the strategy on the linear space has similar output distribution but we also need to make sure that um, just if we just look at which com which part we're in that that is the same in the conditional distribution and in the the full linear space and that is just where the small bias comes in. So um, when you're looking at like which coset of this linear space you're in, that is just saying like, what is the output of some linear function with the short-ish output? Or, and, um, and so the small bias says that that has a similar distribution in the two cases. So that's, this is like the, I guess the, most the hardest part of the the proof is just how we use uh, small bias sets. Um, and so the last thing is how we take an arbitrary event and decompose it into small bias sets. Um, and this this decomposition will go into in a little bit of detail, not too much detail, but it's it's like. Um, so we start with a, a big event, as usual. Okay, by big, I'll quantify that by um, looking at the entropy of uh, a random sample from uh, the conditional distribution on this event. So this is at most 2n. That's what you would get if um, you didn't condition on anything because the GHC distribution has this one bit of redundancy. And so the amount by which the, your entropy of, of uh, the sample is less than that is what we call like a deficiency. And um, so what we wanna show is that we take this event E and we decompose it into relatively big sets that are still small bias in an appropriate linear space. And um, so the idea for the decomposition is kind of similar to what I was describing before, but I'll go into more detail now, which is that um, so while you have some linear distinguisher that has a bias um, on your on your event, you'll partition your event by into the different parts corresponding to the different outputs of your distinguisher. Um, so the way we'll quantify a, a distinguisher being biased is that the entropy of its output will be smaller than it should be. So the um, if it were if we were in the unconditioned query distribution, the um, the output of any linear function would be like sort of maximal on on some space. It'd be like sort of full entropy. And if it's off from that in any way, it'll have to have a little bit less entropy. Um, so what we do when we do this decomposition is we you start with this. Um, just knowing that x 
tilde has some entropy. We split it into these uh, different parts. We split, we split their event into different parts based on um, our distinguisher. Um, and so each part has a, a lower dimension. It's just how linear spaces work. And what happens is that there's a sort of potential function that decreases, which bounds how many times we can do this. So if we look at the entropy that's left in X tilde, given on being in a particular uh, leaf of this tree, I guess. Um, so that conditional entropy goes down by the, by the entropy of, of G0 of X tilde. That's just entropy chain rule. Um, on the other hand, we have an uh, upper bound on the entropy of, or on the conditional entropy that's given by just the dimensions of the, of the linear subspaces that we know X tilde has to be contained in. And the point is that when, when you have a biased G0, the um, amount by which the conditional entropy is decreasing is smaller than the amount by which the upper bound is decreasing. So the, deficient, the entropy de deficiency is going down. And so that, that means that if you keep doing this, um, there will be this potential function that's uh, decreasing. And because it's decreasing, you won't be able to continue this refinement process too far. So the fact that you don't continue too far means that at the end of the day, your sets are still pretty big. And the fact that the reason that you stopped is because there's no G0 that's biased anymore means that each of the, or the, the sets that you end up with have to be in a small bias. So that's the idea of uh, how we do a small bias decomposition. Justin, so, so for each part, you, you, you get a, uh, a good algorithm for a different coordinate. Is, is that an issue? Um, so I guess I was being very hand wavy and you are, you are uh, getting to the part where I was being hand wavy. Um, I, yeah, so I think we, in this part, we actually like, so for there's two decompositions that we, we do in our proof overall. One is this one where we do this decomposition to small bias sets. And the second one is the one that I talked about like, earlier where we further refine our small bias set. For this particular decomposition, I think it's okay. It turns out to be okay that you have a different, you use a different linear distinguisher in each set. For the other one, it is less, it turns out to be less okay. And we, we kind of like, you need to use the same distinguisher at each, for each node in a single given level. Um, but I don't know, this is like kind of below the level of detail that I was I'm, I'm prepared to talk about. Um, Sure, yeah. Uh, uh, let me just uh, another high level comment. It's just to me, uh, I find this the decomposition procedure that you describe very uh, natural, just in analogy. Uh, I think it's similar to uh, density increment arguments in arithmetic combinatorics, where uh, let's say you want a three term for those who know, I mean, maybe it's a good comment. But, uh, you want uh, to show that um, uh, sets uh, uh, three terms arithmetic progressions do not exist in uh, uh, small sets in, in some integers, and uh, you you decompose either if you are correlated with some linear function, you 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 take it, uh, and uh, if you are not, then you know all Fourier coefficients. Uh, are small and you somehow maybe probably different and it's more complicated here, but you 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 win in some potential function. There it's the size, here it's some uh, entropy dependent uh, potential function. And uh, you go up and uh, or down, whatever, and you are bounded. So this bounds the number of iteration. Okay, yeah, that sounds extremely related. I'll have to take a look at that. Um, anyway, so that, that's kind of it as far as uh, technical stuff I wanted to talk about. And so just to summarize what we did, we um, 
So we, we analyze a, a very special case of, of this like conditional hardness problem. Um, we then like, um, we then just try to like, generalize this, I guess, to, so we, we started with linear events, we, we do these like, sort of pseudo linear events, and we have to do like a lot of trickery here that, that seems unnatural and hopefully can get rid of in the future. Um, and then we sort of decompose arbitrary events into this case that we can handle. So just a couple of comments, like these, the first and the third steps seem to be quite general. The, the, um, the so handling linear events, I think that that works for any query distribution that is a linear, well, I mean, it's not fully general, but any query distribution that's uniform over some linear subspace, doesn't have to be the particular GHZ um, query distribution. And this last, and this, like, this decomposition of an arbitrary event into small bias sets also seems to be quite general. Uh, maybe it's even applicable to other types of pseudo-random uh, distributions, not just small bias sets. Um, but it certainly doesn't rely on anything about the underlying query distribution. And so just like to say again, like really the bottleneck for us is, is this um, showing that small bias sets are as hard as linear events or just maybe there's a different notion of pseudo-randomness that, that would make things easier. Or maybe there's just a better analysis here. And but understanding this step better would probably give uh, improved results. Maybe exponential bounds, maybe generalizing to more games. I don't know. Uh, Anyways, that's that's all. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll clap for everybody. Okay. Thanks, Avi. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Please ask Justin questions. Well, I'll ask a dumb question since nobody else is. <laughs> um, so, like, instead of decomposing based on whether you're close to you know, a weight, well, weight close to a pair, you could more generally look at like um, whether you're correlated with some Fourier coefficient or maybe it's low weight Fourier coefficient. I guess, Mester, yeah. So Mester you're, you're, so you're asking if you do decomposition based on on some, on a different Fourier coefficient, on like- Well, instead of just the, instead of just the, you know, being correlated with the, um, with linear functions. With a linear right. function. So, could, yeah. I mean, maybe so that, I think that, maybe that middle step would, <laughs> yeah. Would, yeah, I, I would, I would hope that something like that could be useful. It's just, I think there's just not as developed a theory of, of, uh, I mean, like this linear functions are nice in a lot of ways. There's a great theory of Fourier analysis and we don't, we just don't have, a, as far as I know, like it's not as nice of a theory if you think about nonlinear functions. So let me comment on this since you to um, uh, uh, What happens in this density argument, uh, density increment argument or entropy uh, uh, increment argument, uh, I'm talking you know, <laughs> high level, uh, in yours and in the arithmetic combinatorics one, uh, uh, was developed for nonlinear functions and such a thing can be in principle done for any set of conditions, just any set, not doesn't have to be linear functions. Uh, in some sense, it's related to uh, multiplicative weight update algorithms. Uh, to, uh, uh, I'm not going to go into details, but uh, one particular way in which was, it was applied uh, very powerfully uh, to nonlinear uh, conditions is uh, uh, when Gowers developed the Gowers norm, uh, mm. enabling uh, to argue, you know, just just the same, with the same purposes of their, uh, you know, proving bounds on for longer arithmetic progressions than than three, uh, one needs to argue, you know, you need more uh, some are stronger conditions and uh, nonlinear ones, and and also for these uh, in particular, uh, you can prove such density increment arguments for nonlinear function, and in particular his norms. And uh, uh, yeah, there is a theory there, it was developed, of course, I'll, I'll send you 
uh, references about uh, this afterwards and uh, okay uh, thanks the, it exists and uh, and developed in another part of the world <laughs> and it, in fact it was <laughs> taken by was taken uh, by Tao mainly uh, to the, um, the very high level of notion of structure versus randomness where you basically take any set or any event uh, and any conditions you want like the linear conditions and you can decompose your set to uh, things that uh, look structured like the correlate with linear functions or they look random like uh, not with a linear function it's your set of does not correlate with you know one part doesn't correlate with any of your tests so it looks random and uh, as the other parts look like um, structures and uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful tool generally it was applied in many contexts since so there are surveys about it and uh, okay yeah sounds very tantalizing i i will definitely read more about it I have a question. So, do we know of any games where the, the correct answer is polynomial rather than exponential or constant? Uh, no, not in. Yeah, no, we don't. We think. I think the conjecture is that it's uh, an exponential bound for everything. More questions. All right. In, if not, we'll thank again, Justin. Thank you, Avi, for all your enlightening. Thank you.